Well, good morning and well, Merry Christmas. What a pleasure to have a live audience after so many months, even though you look like a hospital ICU here. <laughs> we just need a few saline bottles and it will look like a hospital ICU. But thank you so much for joining today. We tried our best to make this as uh, safe as possible for us. In fact, I was just wondering, uh, with this new scare that we have of the new virus strain, whether we should really meet or not. But uh, in that respect, we need to dis make a decision with regards to uh, the New Year celebrations. So maybe we'll discuss that and we will let you know. But I also want to uh, uh, greet everybody in uh, virtual land, online land, whatever land you call yourselves in. But thank you so much for joining every, all of you for joining us. I can see you on the screen, which is uh, to my right here. Uh, I must uh, ask you all to congratulate and uh, truly appreciate the efforts of Praveen and Nelson and Ravi and a few others who made this possible. We are the first time we are making history, actually. We are going pan-India. <laughs> Though we are in a small room here, our reach is now going all the way to, let me see, uh, uh, Kerala with Sheila there and uh, Bertram in Mumbai and I'm presuming, well, of course, we have uh, those in Pune and uh, I'm, I'm, uh, this is also going on YouTube, so I'm presuming that there will be a few more joining. Uh, so I'm very grateful that we can uh, start services that is going to go uh, online and all our worship services, we hope that we can put online so we can have truly a, you know, participation from all over India. And uh, thank you, uh, Sikinder, for leading us in the opening prayer. Uh, he is praying, he was praying from Karnul and here we could hear it. Isn't that wonderful, right? Uh, for the message today, uh, and you will soon see it on the screen as uh, our technical team puts it on the screen. And I'm presuming somebody will give me the, the slide changer <laughs> so I can change my slides as we move along. The title of my message today is actually a quote from uh, a, a lady called Amy Carmichael. Uh, now, this quote is, according to the internet, it identifies various authors, but I would like to stick to Amy Carmichael because her, names, her name kept coming more often than the others. And as we wait for that uh, visual to come up, let me read to you the quotation that I was able to glean from the internet that is attributed to Amy Carmichael. The quotation is, you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. Let me repeat that and I hope it will sink into you. You can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. Amy Carmichael, like I mentioned, uh, is actually a missionary from Ireland. She did mission work in uh, Ch China, in Japan. And interestingly enough, after that, she came to India and served close to 55 years uh, in a place called Donavur in Tamil Nadu until, of course, she died at the age of 83. Uh, in 1951, she died at Donavur and a headstone is inscribed as Ammai, which in Tamil perhaps means revered mother. So um, the quotation once again that she, uh, you know, penned 
we'll come back to that but let me just see if i can go to the next slide if you will notice this this is the uh, mission the mission center that she started in donavur in tamil nadu and where she was and it exists even today and she had focused on child development community development healthcare i'm presuming she also has a hospital uh, somewhere in the vicinity of that particular place and of course amy carmichael perhaps learned to live with that principle that which we just read in the quotation to love means to give if you if you attempt to love you cannot help but giving and i suppose she tried to do it to the best of her ability and i was as i was focusing on the quotation it reminded me of how the bible describes love and i'd like to explore that a little bit more with you today and so join me on this very short journey as we look at love and this quotation that talks about how you cannot love without giving uh the quotation of course also says you can give without love uh giving without loving is possible and the bible actually affirms that for example very soon you'll have to some of us or most of us will have to file tax returns and you have paid taxes i'm not sure if you really loved paying taxes now it's an obligation we have to do it but to say that you love paying taxes is probably a stretch it's uh, it's more of an obligation and so giving without loving is actually a transaction right it's more transactional in nature uh and even some who give in a very great manner uh sometimes only becomes transactional many of you will remember the love chapter right 1 corinthians chapter 13 interestingly enough there in verse 3 it says if i give all i possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that i may boast but do not have love i gain nothing this confirms that one can give without love the bible is saying and the apostle uh paul in this uh quote in this uh, scripture is saying that you can even give all you possess to the poor or you can give your body to be burnt as it says in some other translations but if you have not love it basically is nothing so you can give without love but as you see on the screen you really cannot love without giving you see when you love you cannot help but also give because giving is intrinsic to love love you cannot say you love without some kind of giving right giving is a manifestation of love you know you can't see love can you all can any one of us see love no you can't but we can see the evidence of love when you give love is seen and shown by giving and why do i say that because love is relational it is not transactional like i mentioned a little earlier love is relational it says it all doesn't it when you say love is relational because it seeks the very best in the in the object that you know of love the object that you love and of course coming to the scripture and what uh, uh manoa read for us we know that god is love uh and if i can just go to that scripture there the very famous scripture that i'm sure all of us remember by heart that god so loved the world that he gave his one and only son 
See, God is love. It says, God loved the world. So it shows that God is love. Intrinsically love. And for us, those of us who have come to understand this from the, uh, from the Reformation that we went through, uh, to recognize the triune nature of God makes this definition of love so perfect. I mean, this is so perfect. Or rather, it makes perfect sense when we understand God as being triune. And the fact that he is love, intrinsically love, makes that indeed so very uh, meaningful. So John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world. How did he love? How do you know he loved? What is the evidence that he loved? Interestingly, notice what it says immediately following that. That he gave. Love means you have to give. You cannot have love without giving. You see, that is the uh, quotation that I read from. And why does God give? Because he is love. He gives and his giving, if you continue to read, for oh God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, uh, that whosoever believes in him shall have eternal life. So this giving is not just temporary. It seeks an eternal result. This giving seeks for something that is more permanent results in an eternal relationship right and of course as it goes on to say whoever believes that means love also requires reciprocity it must be received and enjoyed and utilized and it is complete when it is reciprocated so we begin to see the nature of love as uh, described for us in the scriptures john who is the writer of the gospel, also in his epistle, explains this further. Let's just explore this scripture in 1 John chapter 4, verse 9. It says, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. Verse 10, this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. You know, I've been watching uh, some debates between atheists and those who believe in God. Atheists are those who don't believe in God. And the constant refrain with regards to atheists is, where is the evidence for God? How can you prove that God exists? I can prove many things, you know, on a physical basis in a lab or whatever. But they say, where is the evidence for God? And here is the evidence, right? Here is the evidence. Because some people think that, oh, the Bible is just a fabrication. It's just a story. It is fables. It's mythology, right? But interestingly enough, Reza Aslan, I'm not sure if you are familiar with that name, but he is a, uh, I think he is, he was a Christian and then he moved to some kind of a religious person, but more, more atheistic. And, and the reason I, I quote him, it's because I've been watching a, a, a fair bit of his uh, you know, debates recently. Uh, and I'm presuming he is more towards atheism rather than being, you know, believing in any particular religion or a God. But he says... When he talks about evidence, he himself says that there is enough evidence that Jesus lived, he preached to the Jews, and he died in the crucifixion. He says, historically, there is enough evidence. Even if you don't have the Bible, you can prove that there is, there was a man called Jesus. And of course, that he preached and died in the crucifixion. So, John brings out the evidence. This is how God showed his love amongst us. He sent his one and only son, historical evidence that there, that there was a Jesus. And we believe him to be the son. Right? 
Now, many atheists would say, well, even if he, if he lived, if he, if he was real, maybe he was just a man. Now, of course, when we bring in the scriptures, we begin to see he was not just a man. He was a man. But of course, he was also the son of God. So, as it says in verse 10, this is love. Not that we loved God. See, God loved the world before we could even recognize it. Uh, God is the one who showed us what love is. And this is how we know that God loved us. Here is the evidence. And in verse 10, as it says, this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son. Once again, notice giving. He sent his son. He gave something to prove that he loved us. He gave us, as we have come to believe and understand and accept, the most precious gift. A gift that cannot be contained in a box and wrapped in gold paper. The gift of the person of Jesus Christ. Through whom we have life, as it says. Right? In verse 9. The one and only son into the world that we might live through him. Right? And that is why we celebrate Christmas. That is why Christmas is important for us. It is part of the Christian calendar. We need to recognize the coming of the Son and the birth of the Son, the incarnation of the Son. Because uh, without Christmas, you don't have Good Friday. And without the Good Friday, you don't have Easter Sunday. And without Easter Sunday, you don't have the Ascension. And without the Ascension, you don't have the Holy Spirit. So, the Incarnation, the birth of Christ is important. And that is why we celebrate the birth of Christ. The, as we understand it as God coming in, in the flesh, as was read to us in the scriptures. So Christmas celebrates that God loves us and wants us to have eternal life. So while we celebrate and enjoy this gift, this precious gift, how should we understand this? Or perhaps what should be our response? Yeah, I want to leave you with two, just two quick thoughts. It's more like the application of what we understand. Uh, with regards to God's love. So the first thought I'd like to leave you with is the fact that the attitude with which we give reveals the measure of your love. And many of you know the scripture from the book of uh, Corinthians where it talks about lo God loves a cheerful giver. You see, God wants us or the very nature of love, you could say, is done willingly. It is never forced. It does not have compulsion. Because love is genuine only when it is relationally given. Right? Not transactionally. Not giving to get from the other hand. But lo love when it is cheerfully given, when it is willingly done, when it is not forced, when it is not done with compulsion, is relational, not transactional. And of course, uh, we give because we want to appreciate what God has given to us. And we want to return that, reciprocate that love of God. Many of you will uh, remember the widow's might, you know, this story. And I'm taking the story from the book of Mark. It's also found in Luke. The widow's might talks about the attitude of giving. Let me just read uh, just a part of that story. Jesus sat down. I'm reading from Mark chapter 12 and verse 41. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins, worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly, 
I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave, Jesus said, out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. Jesus' focus in this particular story, in this passage, is on her attitude, her inner motivation, right? not on the size of her donation. And so, a very important point for us to understand that the attitude with which we give reveals the measure of our love. When we give, perhaps we should ask the question, is it out of love? Or is it out of compulsion? Is it given to manipulate? Because a lot of giving is manipulation. We see it in the world all around us. Giving only to get. Manipulation. But that's not the love that we understand from the scriptures. So when we give, perhaps we must ask ourselves, deep in our hearts, is it transactional or is it relational? Let's check our attitude every time we give. Every time we have the opportunity, perhaps we must pray and ask God to give us the right attitude. Because we all fall short, don't we? Perhaps we can ask God, give us the attitude with which, like perhaps the attitude the poor widow had, to give relationally, to give willingly, cheerfully, not to manipulate and not to get uh, and to do it out of compulsion. Let me share one more thought with you. And that is I'm found in the book of 1 John chapter 3 when we talk about application of what we understand today. Verse 16 onwards it says, this is how we know what love is. Once again, John is explaining what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Very clearly written by the Apostle John in terms of what love is and what we understand what love should be as uh, from the scriptures. The love of God very clearly helps us to see. Christmas helps us to see that you cannot love without giving. And we have been given the precious gift of Jesus Christ. But that prompts us to reciprocate. You love, you receive that love, then to be able to then love one another. And that's what the scripture is telling us. How do we show this love? Well, it says it has a very tall order. It says by laying down your lives. But it goes on to explain not that your laying down of your life is not necessarily, you know, opening yourself to take a bullet or allow a person to stab you. No. Uh, it says, how do, we, how do we lay down our lives? It says in verse 17, by sharing what you have, by helping by serving, by giving. So you lay down your lives continuously, constantly, regularly. We are laying down our lives by doing, by sharing and giving and serving and taking care of the needs that we see around us. Remember what the quotation said? You cannot love without giving. Love means to give. Love means that it, it has to be, it has to prompt you to give. Verse 18, notice it says, Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. In other words, our love must not remain in words. It must be converted into action. Like I always like to say, love is ultimately an action, not just a feeling. Unfortunately, Bollywood and Hollywood has uh, taught us that love is a feeling 
butterflies in your stomach or uh, or uh, virus in your heart no <laughs> we're talking of talking of virus a bit too much these days but love is not just a feeling love is primarily an action it will lead to good feelings but love is primarily an action and that's the reason why if you remember the apostle james tells us faith without works is dead and uh, many a times i have wondered about that verse and uh, you know why is james saying faith without works is dead i mean don't we believe that works does not save us but notice what he's saying is he's not saying salvation without works is dead that's not what he's saying he's saying faith without works is dead indirectly actually what he's saying is you cannot love without giving you cannot have faith in god without some kind of action reciprocation some kind of you know manifestation of that love that love cannot remain only in words it has to translate into action jonathan edwards an 18th century preacher and philosopher he said the following and i like this quotation he said love is no ingredient in a speculative faith but is the life and soul of a practical faith our faith must be practical and that is where we come to understand love makes our faith practical it is love that makes our faith practical why because you and i cannot love without giving we cannot love without giving so brethren the greatest act of love leads to the greatest act of giving right jesus christ our lord sacrificed to bring us into a relationship but this sacrifice started with the greatest act of giving the greatest act of giving is what we were led in the reading from the book of isaiah unto us a son is given unto us a son is given giving that is the manifestation of god's love for us and like i said to a little earlier christmas has to come christmas has to be remembered christmas is very important for our faith because like i said without christmas there is no good friday and there is no resurrection and there is no ascension and there is no holy spirit there is no pentecost so brother let's enjoy the true meaning of christmas perhaps i bring you one dimension of christmas there are many dimensions of it but i'm just bringing you this one aspect and i hope that it will help you to ponder that every time that you trust in god and have faith in god and every time we give we are constantly asking that whether we are doing it in the way the bible explains it so brethren as we uh pravin can move to that last slide uh, this is for some reason not moving it uh as we celebrate christmas this year uh let us remember the greatest act of giving god has given his son that we might have eternal life and as we celebrate let us not forget that we cannot love without giving merry christmas